Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com. That is the home of online lessons and courses teaching you how to play the double bass. So if you want to learn more about that, please follow the links below. And today I'm backstage at the Barbican Centre in London with, uh, well, one of my jazz bass heroes. He's come to talk to us about his approach to playing and teaching the double bass. It's the great Larry Grenadier. Larry, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I've been uh, asking uh, friends and colleagues about what we, we should discuss, and a lot of people have been one of, well, one of the common questions and themes has been, what are the issues that you see with your students? I know that you've done a lot of teaching over the years. You're currently teaching in Basel, is that correct? Yeah, in Switzerland, yeah. In Switzerland, yeah. Um, and yeah, what are the kind of common issues, maybe technically, first of all, that might be holding them back? And then we could sure. maybe talk about some other bits. Yeah, I, I found over the years that definitely there's certain things that every bass player is dealing with. And, and it's um, from beginning level, all the way up and I'm kind of still dealing with the same things hopefully at a more advanced point you know but um, you know because the bass is such a physical instrument in that it's so large and the space between the notes is so big and it's fretless yeah I find unlike almost any other instrument that fundamentally bass, bass players really have to focus on where all the notes are yeah you know I mean as as kind of simple as that sounds, we obviously know that it's not so simple, right? And also, once you know them, how would you move through the fingerboard in a you know, holistic way so that you, you're you not limited by movement in order to speak whatever you want to speak in the moment, which jazz is asking us to do. So with your left hand technique, do you have a kind of set approach, you know, if you were, or do you, you know? Yeah, so what I, what I be, it's, it's really different in jazz and for classical. In classical music, everything's written out. You could work on your fingerings and then you go to the gig and you're cool, hopefully, you know, or you work on it as a section or whatever. With jazz, you need a bit more freedom of movement, I think, you know. So, um, you know, most of us, myself included, we um, learned the, the instrument kind of through a semandal approach of learning position by position and we, we make our way up and eventually, yeah, we've reached the thumb position and then, you know, we're there. Um, and it works. I mean, you learn the instrument that way. It's one of those things you kind of learn it and then you forget it, right? I mean, I never think about now I'm jumping into fifth position. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> I wouldn't even know what that is, actually. But um, the way I, I, at some point early on, uh, I can't remember if a teacher told me or if I just kind of fell into it, but was to play scales improvising my fingerings. So if I'm playing a C major scale, for example, I'm going to start on the lowest note I can in that key on this instrument. Yeah. Low E. And I'll go up. Go back down a different way. doing that so for the sake of time you know every time a different way but it should be much slower so for example like that right so you come up with all these different ways to cross the strings to move through the bass so I'm not just going up to the G string up to G string back yeah down. that whole kind of across yeah. and, then, yeah. and I think you know even because we've learned that way we continue to play that way and it's a really it's one way but it's typically not the best way to move through the instrument yeah so I just used to practice scales in that way of improvising one way up back down another way up way so you said at the beginning that you were a lot of this material that you're, that's holding the students back is perhaps some of the same material that you're working on these, these fundamentals. Are you still yeah. practicing them when you get the bass out? What do you typically do? Well, you know, practicing for me is very fluid, you know, the last, say, 10 years. I mean, I don't have a, a, a routine. You know, I don't wake up and play long tones. I mean, I could, I guess, but that's just not what I do. Um, you know, I... I it, 
it's kind of whatever, if I have to work on certain repertoire, then I might be really focusing on that. But uh, typically, I'm practicing classical music on the bass mm -hmm. because it, it pushes my technique, makes me do things that I hadn't thought about, and you know, I might play, um, and there's certain things I've played, practiced over the years, Bach, you know, cello suites, play through the chorales, you know, different things, and, um, but then that's expanded over the years. It's like somebody turns me, I hear something, somebody tells me to check out something, or I just go through a music store and pull out something, and it's like, oh, that's cool, and I'm not sure how to get that out of the bass, and so I, it just pulls out the technique that, for me, really works as a practice to, to push it further. Um, um, since we're in, in London, uh, Benjamin Britten's cello music, to me, it was, has been really a great way to practice. Yeah. The solo, um, solo cello suites. But there's so much with classical repertoire. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a big part of my practice, for sure. Do you work on scales and arpeggios every time you pick the bass? No, that? not anymore. I mean, actually, but I have been, I mean, I, I have been practicing. Yeah, so we get rid of the stool? Yeah, because I really can't play sitting down yeah, <laughs> that's that's anymore. Yeah, let's move the stool out of the way. Um, I do practice lately yeah. uh, chromatic scales. Sure. You know, just because of all the, op there's so many options. And I'm kind of improvising, I'm improvising those fingerings and some of them don't really make any sense. So uh, in the process of doing it slowly, I would be thinking of what, well, what is the best way, which to me means less Shifting, yeah. So, sh shifting, fingering. This is these are things that I'm constantly thinking about. Actually, whenever I'm playing anything, even if like Brad writes a bass line, like what's here's one fingering, here's another unison way. line when it's stuff the, like yeah, this, right? right? And then I say, can I play it across the bass? Yeah. Can I use open strings to make it easier? It's t because it's kind of that always thing. Like, uh, how can I make this instrument that's kind of tricky physically easier to play? And I find you know fingerings. Uh, using open strings to shift through the bass. These are the things that are oh, so much easier. <laughs> what about right hand? You get, you get a great sound, Larry, and I think that we often omit, to, you know, talking as much about the right hand. Is there anything you've particularly worked on that you've, you know, that's helped you develop that sound? So right hand is really, yeah, it's not so discussed, right? I, I, there's no books, really. And everyone seems it. to do it differently. And we all do, I think that's why. I, I'm even thinking about things like posture. Everyone stands so differently. Right, the and way to hold the bass. It's all bass, related. Yeah. And, sure. Yeah. And just the, the shape of our hands, you yeah. know? For me, I want to have options. So I, I play pretty much in three different ways. I'll play, you know, a la Ray Brown with mm. as much skin of the first finger on the string. Mm. I'm also using this as kind of a one-fingered approach, trying okay. to get as much skin of the middle finger on the string yeah so that they sound the same and then the same thing of alternate yeah so that i can do that and have it sound like i'm not alternating but i have the 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 um, agility of of using two fingers so yeah. i'm kind of alternating between those things i'm trying to maintain a certain sound that i want to get that um is really just a uh, kind of a uh, an amalgamation of all the bass players I like. Hopefully, <laughs> you know, it's. Um, but who are the, what's the in terms of like the the sound concept that you have? Mm -hmm. Then who are you kind of? I don't know. Or where are you drawing on? Or who are the players that oh, you really so like? Oh, so many. In terms so of many. sound. Yeah, for sound, I mean, really, uh, a, a wide. You know, from. Uh, you know, obviously Ray Brown, Ron Carter. Um, how about Charlie Hayden? Char absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, kind of everybody that everybody talks about. You yeah. Know? I mean, we all love the same people, really. You know, and um, uh, you know, and then non-bass players. Yeah. You know, and singers, and you know, so it's kind of trying to always. I mean, this is what we practice: is like we have an idea of what we want to get out of the bass. How do we get it from our heads, through our bodies, through our hands, through the instrument out? And I think that's like we're trying to dissect each level of that and when it comes to the right hand I want to have control over I don't want it just to do whatever it wants you know like a left hand of a pianist who just kind of is on autopilot you know and the bass player has to suffer through that so it seems you know with the right hand like I don't want it just to just do whatever it wants to do I want to tell it what to do yeah and I want it to come close to this idea of the sound that I have in my head part of it for me is playing at the end of the fingerboard 
okay. uh, because the string is tighter at that point, closer to the bridge. Do you tend to be focused there most of the time, or do you sort I, of... I always stay there. Yeah, that's your, I don't that's move. your thing, yeah. Um, because it, it speaks quicker, yeah. because it's tighter. And I can actually play lighter. I don't have to pull the sound out, it's already there. So I, I just kind of always keep it there, and I feel like the sound is coming from my back, where there's the most strength, I would say, coming down my arm. That's outstretched. It's not at an angle like this. Yeah. I mean, this is completely just my view of it because every bass player does it differently and they all can get a great sound no matter what. But for me, I think of it that way. So I'm letting, I'm letting gravity help me to let the notes kind of falling out. So I don't have to work as hard as if, you know, like if I have to feel like I have to really pull the sound out of the instrument. Because if you're playing in a big room like the, we're at the Barbican Center in London right now backstage, and if you're playing on the main stage, that's a big room. Yeah. And there's a big, you know, it's quite a, right where we're in a very intimate space at the moment when you're right, in there. Right, sure. You know, do you... Yeah, every night's a different, a different thing. So, you know, you, in a big room, you're really just trying to make the sound on stage for the three of us. You know, like, yeah. I'm playing for Jeff and for Brad, really. Yeah. You know, and then our sound guy helps to transfer that to the house. You know, so... Do you tour, tour with the same sound guy? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that makes it, does, that's makes really it much nice. easier. So, you know, I, I, I'm not really trying to... I, there's no way I could push the sound of this acoustic instrument and have it fill the room, you mm -hmm. know? I just try to get it so I'm getting good sound. It's, it's, I'm not overworking to do it, and everybody can hear me on stage. Yeah. And then it, hopefully it transfers to the audience. I mean, sometimes it's hard, but... Um, I think I, you, have, I, you have to have trust, don't you? You have and to have trust. You have, a, you have a team that you're working with to present these shows, and absolutely. they'll be taking care of that and pushing but it I forward. I do find this to be a common issue with young bass players is that we feel this needs, and I went through it so I know, of having to feel like we have to always constantly push the sound out. Yeah. Because it's a relatively soft instrument compared to other instruments. Yeah. So there is this trust, you know, but everything affects it. If you play in tune, for example, your sound resonates better. You know, uh, you know the position of your right hand, everything as you move through the instrument, you maintain a certain sound that's going to amplify better. Yeah. So it's not always about energy output. It's, Clarity. Yeah, the clarity of the information. And, and it, it makes it so that the drummer can hear where, I, where my beat is because the start of the note is very clear. You know? So all these things help to actually lighten up and relax when we're playing, I think. So w when you were, you, you know, I know that you studied uh, earlier in your career with, um, with Ron Carter. And I'm kind of thinking about, I know, where did you get the jazz information from that you're, you know, was, was there some kind of, I mean, what, first of all, what was it like studying with Ron? That's the, that's the big question, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. He's an amazing teacher, you know, yeah. and he really loves to teach. You can tell and he's got very clear ideas and it's not, you know, well, you could do this, you could do this, you know, it's like, do this, you know. Yeah, you know? I bet. And it's stuff, you know, that really pays, there's no messing around. You do it, it's like you see the results. I, it was really a beautiful, I mean, I, I, I could have done it for many months, but I only did actually for a couple months, but steady for a couple months. And I really, stuff that I learned, I still think about. Absolutely. You know, I mean, he's one of the great teachers, besides being one of the great. What was he kind of picking you up on? What did he want to, do you remember? Very fundamental things. You yeah. know, he has everybody do the same thing, really, yeah. of, you know, playing a, a B flat scale in half position. Yeah. And then um, really, a lot of things about uh, bass lines, you know, about really paying attention to every note you play. And he has certain exercises that really force you to think about every chord note. And it's, it's kind of, you know, that, that idea is like, of course we think about every chord note. But once you get into this, you say, wait a second, we're not. Maybe we're thinking about 60%. But we play so many chord notes, wow, all of a sudden I think, well, I have to, I have to commit and, um, you know, really care about every chord note I play, it's a huge responsibility over the course of, you know, whatever, 20 courses of blues or something, <laughs> you know? So, you know, through that process, through Ron's, you know, ideas, that it really made, made that muscle in my brain, you know, react to every note I play has to have some care behind it. And then what I realized was the more care I put to the notes, the more care everybody put to listening to what notes I'm playing. So the role of the bass becomes much ampl more amplified because we have much more of a, a play in the music. Were there any other kind of uh, teachers that 
you know, that you spent time with that had an influence on you in the jazz world, maybe? Or well, in the jazz possibly. world, not so much. You know, I had a couple early teachers um, uh, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. Um, the first teacher I ever had, was, his name was Paul Breslin, who was a jazz bass player there, and Frank Tusa. And, but even with them, it was mostly classical stuff mm. we, we dealt with. Um, and jazz, I really learned through playing a lot and through listening to records. Yeah, right. that's great advice. Um, so in terms of the students that you're teaching now, we, we've looked at, at some of the technical aspects that are holding them back, but what about the musical aspects that you think that are stopping them from expressing the, their improvised bass lines and solos? What is it that you kind of, the issues present themselves? It's, it's a really interesting thing for me to talk about jazz stuff because it gets tricky for me because I can't really sit around and talk about soloing because, you know, if, obviously you need to know the form of the tune, the harmony of the tune. You gotta ma be able to maintain that through your solo. But other than that, I don't really wanna get in the way of what they choose to play. I mean, the, the, the typical thing I see with young bass players is that they're showing me in their bass lines previous to their solo that they do know the form and the harmony. Yeah. And then it comes to the solo and it kind of left the room. Um, so I think there's, it's almost a conceptual idea that there's a big difference between bass lines and soloing. And I don't think there is. I think that wall is really kind of man-made. So yeah. I try to think of it as an extension of a bass line. Mm. Typically, yeah, you play more notes and different rhythms and quarter notes, but I like to think of them really as related. And so when I go to solo, I'm not just kind of reacting and playing whatever I want to play. I'm really kind of doing the same things, like le leading towards chord tones and yeah. showing the form really clearly. You know, so I, I find that to be a common issue with with bass players is that uh, just to con continue the same way that you're thinking about bass lines when you go to play a solo. You know, simplify, simplify until it's so cool that then you can play more information. Did you transcribe a lot? You mentioned, um, you know, like listening to these the recordings of our jazz bass heroes. Were there any that you kind of spent time transcribing? I did a, a fair amount of transcribing. Maybe I don't know, not so much yeah. actually. I mean, when I was, but it was quite when I was quite young. You know, uh, I a teacher did have me said uh, transcribe. Um, this was interesting. In the first week, you know, said transcribe uh, "Body and Soul" by Jimmy Blanton. And then Scott LaFaro playing uh, Satin Doll with Victor Feldman. So, I mean, you see this huge uh, movement of the bass and whatever that was, not so long, I guess 20, 30 years of, you know. Um, but it, uh, really early it showed me, wow, there's a lot of ways to, to play this instrument in jazz, you know. And this listening a lot, uh, I was very fortunate to play with a lot of really amazing musicians, very young, way before I was really capable of it, but kind of fell into those situations. Yeah, Stan Getz. How yeah, old so were you when you played with Stan Getz? Well, I was, I was in college. I, I was already in college. But some people, even before that, that, you know, it was just fortunate. It was really just very lucky, and I learned what that level of listening was like with, with great musicians who had mastered their instruments and their ears were just wide open. And what their anything. expectations were, I guess. Did yeah, they, did and what they expected they from the from bass, you know, that I really learned, well, you know, they want a bass player that's keeping the form, has a good sound, can keep the time, the time feels good. You know, kind of fundamental things that are throughout not just jazz, but every genre, right? I mean, it's, it's like that in every, that, 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 that's why the, I find the bass really interesting because it's in almost every type of music. And its function is the same, you know? So I really like the kind of, you know, grabbing from different genres and bringing it into this, into jazz, because because jazz is really open to different influences anyhow, but also because what, what the bass does in classical music, if you're playing the Brandenburg, or you're playing R&B music, and you're playing Stevie Wonder, or you're playing bluegrass music, yeah. fundamentally, the bass is doing the same thing, yeah. right? It's showing the harmony, it's showing the form, it's rhythmically helping the vibe, the groove, and you know, it's, it's like, it's in its counterpoint, it's, it's counter melodies. So I just grabbed from all that stuff and tried to find a technique in order to play it on this instrument. Same thing with electric bass, you know? So 
It, so with, your, with the ear training side of things, did you, is it something that you caught? I, I know some people spend, have spent a lot of time maybe with the piano, uh, maybe they've done a lot of transcription. Other people, they just seem to just, just do it. I mean, is it something that you've kind of worked on as a specific area of your playing? Because uh, you're training? Of, yeah, because it's just, I keep thinking about you playing with Brad Meldow and, uh, you know, and, and Stan Getz, and they expect a lot, you know, and they're giving out a lot of information in, in, their, in their music. And they, sure. you know, like, uh, how, yeah, is it something that you've specifically addressed, or is it something that we learned more? It was learned very pragmatically. I think, <laughs> yeah. like, what do I need to get by, you know? And then it slowly builds up. You know, the transcribing helps, of course. I mean, whenever I listen to music, I'm saying, oh, what? You know, try to figure out the changes and what key it's in. You know, like, we do it all the time. And then, I mean, but there's a certain issue I think that's interesting is with ear training is. Yeah, we want to have good ears. We don't all have perfect pitch. You know, we want to develop our relative pitch. Um, but it's almost, you have to have taste in it too because not everybody wants to hear what they're playing played back. You don't want to mimic, right? Yeah. And so sometimes people with really great they're ears. They're desperate to show you. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Especially at a younger age, yeah. you know. So I think it's, it's important to know what information you want to grab and what's appropriate. to. That's the taste thing, isn't it? Like yeah. using pedal tones or uh, mm. triplet fills or you know as soon as yeah. you learn these things you then so that's part of transcribing for me is to transcribe the notes and then to go deeper and to see why you think they played what they played and that's based on the environment that they're playing in. we've been talking about some of these great young players that you've been teaching and I just wonder if there's anyone that you've been listening to we've spoken a lot about some of the older generation of players you know the um, Jimmy Blanton and, and what have you I, there's some kind of younger bass players that you're hip to at the moment that you're thinking, you know, maybe you've got some records, uh, you know, sure. uh, that you oh, maybe man. give us a give us a shout out to some of the players. That I mean, all the time. I mean, you know, young, <laughs> younger than me, let's say, right? Because there's always young, young, you know, who the Joey Alexander of the double bass, whoever right. that is, you know. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure there are, you know. Oh. Well, I mean, I've had some students who are I mean, incredibly talented who very early found the technical issues. They they, they got to those. Very, very quickly. Yeah. So now it's just about them experiencing music and, and finding their voice. But um, yeah, I mean, there's so there are so many. I mean, last night I was off here in London. I went and saw Robert Glasper with Derek Hodge on electric bass, and I mean, it's phenomenal. You it's know? a good week of jazz. You know, Dave Holland's playing in London this evening. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. In competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've got there are two incredible gigs here. But, uh, he's at Ronnie Scott's. I was oh, that's like, great. Well, I couldn't believe it. I looked that's to my diary. I was like, what's happening? Yeah, sometimes it happens, right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's, you know, there's, they're really in New York. It's really, it's really fun because, I mean, I don't live right in the city anymore, but I, I, I'm aware of uh, like this constant influx of great bass players. And I think yeah. there's really been a nice. Each instrument kind of has its moment, and I think in the last five, ten years, it's been a nice rise in the bass players and, and their ability to kind of play in many situations, have the technique available to them to navigate through different genres of, of jazz and, um, and are making a very personal statement. So it, it, it's a good time for bass, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, happy. absolutely. Well, Larry, that's a perfect way to finish. So thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're preparing for this show um, and we will be providing links about the things that we spoke about underneath. And if you want to learn more about Discoverable Bass and what we do, please go and check out the website. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all next time.